This is the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes, author of the number one Amazon bestseller, Make More Money Selling Your Art, proven techniques to turn your passion into profit. Hey, if you've got a question, a concern, a comment, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Just email me, eric at artmarketing.com uh, or come live on the podcast. We'll record your questions. All right. This question comes from Mark Reynolds in Quincy, California. Mark says, I own a frame and sh gallery shop in Quincy. In 2024, I'll be organizing my third Plen Air Festival. Congratulations on that, Mark. That's pretty cool. The first year, 23 artists attended. In 2023, there were 38 artists. In 2024, I'm expecting 60 artists. I advertised in two magazines, plus Facebook and Instagram, and I need to attract more art buyers to attend the reception and the street fair. What else can I do to attract uh, out-of-area art buyers? The area is full of artists, but not very well known. Well, that's a big question, Mark. First, congratulations on doing that. I think it's really important to uh, to start plein air events. You know, there are are now hundreds of plein air events around the world, and there there were none when we started this magazine, or very few, maybe maybe under three or four. Uh, so it's really changed a lot, and 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 people like you are important to us. Uh, and thank you. I know one of the advertising places you spent money in was Plein Air Magazine. Thank you. Uh, it's a, it's a good place to be if you're selling a Plein Air event. Um, many galleries have tried to avoid things like what you've done because they think it hurts their business. Because I we had a gallery say to us, you know, I, I don't. I don't want to be a part of a plein air event because all these people are going to come to town. They're going to buy paintings at the plein air event and they're not going to buy paintings from my artist and from my gallery. And I said, Oh, contraire. They will because they're in it. They're, they're here to see art. They love art. They go see paintings. They want, they're going to wander into every gallery in town. They're going to buy paintings. And sure enough, that turns out to be true. So uh, I applaud you because a lot of galleries might have just uh, rejected that whole idea. So that's really nice. Um, people get this uh, art buying dopamine high and they like to buy art. And so when they come around for a plein air event, you know, especially if you're sponsoring it, you're going to sell art. You're going to have a, a, big, a big success. And I think we all need to approach things with an abundance mindset instead of, you know, a protective mindset. Now, you say you advertised in a couple of magazines that you need to attract more art buyers to attend. Well, let's take that. Um, let's take that question first. I think that the the question is how did you advertise in those magazines? I know you advertised in one of ours, um, Plein Air Magazine. I don't know if you advertised in Fine Art Connoisseur, which is where all the collectors are. Um, and I think you advertised in one of the Western publications. All good all good decisions. But the, the things you've got to ask yourself is, did I have enough frequency? Frequency is the repetition of ads. And did I have an ad that really stood out, that got attention, that made people slap them in the face and made them pay attention and get their attention? Um, I think everyone in the plein air world needs a, a dual strategy. And the dual strategy is a local strategy and a national strategy. Now, a national strategy would be something like Plein Air Magazine, right? Because you're reaching a national audience. And it's important for a lot of reasons. First off, it reaches art collectors who are specifically Plein Air collectors, and it reaches people who oftentimes travel to shows, especially if it's a regional thing. You know, if it's a couple hour drive, three hour drive, a weekend away, then it's cool. Say, hey, I'm going to drive up to your town to Quincy and uh, experience this event. But the other reason it's important is because the key to a successful plein air event is the artists. And because the chatter from artists goes like this, hey, I went to this plein air event and they didn't have any good artists and they didn't sell any work, I'm not going back. So the other artists, when they get the opportunity to go, eh, I'm gonna skip that one. And to make yourself known. So what, what we typically say is you want at least three. And one is a call for artists early on at the time you're getting ready to solicit artists to have them come in. And then the second one is um, about a month or two months before the event 
and get and then the third one is right before the event and then we recommend also that you get on our newsletters and things like that so that it's a reminder hey next weekend is this make sure you come to this make sure you schedule this that kind of a thing i think that's really important but you know you really need to reach local people because Anybody who's within a, uh, let's say, an hour or two hour driving distance is the most likely to come to your event. And so where do you reach people like that? Well, the first question is, uh, you know, are you a suburb of another area? Are you isolated in the middle of nowhere? I don't know the answer to that because I don't know where Quincy is. I should know. I'm sorry. But I think the, the idea here is there are lots of ways you can advertise locally and there are local, you know, websites, newspapers, magazines, uh, tourism uh, books, things like that. We have up here in the Adirondacks, we have a very successful plein air festival. It's it's in its twentieth year, and you know they are everywhere. They have banners on the streets. They get the local community to put up banners, so it's talking to the tourists. You know, they're they're in all the local magazines. There's stories in the newspaper. They're really working the PR angle. Uh, they are advertising. They have posters all over town. That you know, they do all those things. All of those things matter. Not one works independently. Um, so you want to make sure that you're getting out and having a local strategy, but you also want to have that national prestige because you need those. You know, there sometimes it's one collector who sees that ad who comes in and buys, you know, six or eight paintings. It spends twenty thousand dollars. You know, that's that's what you hope for. Um, and so make sure that you're doing both of those things. I think that's important. The other thing I like media partners, I like collaborations, media partners would be, you know, you go to the local city magazine, uh, in the surrounding area or the local TV station, a local radio station. And you say, Hey, I'm going to put your logo on the posters. You're going to have a presence. You can have a booth, a table, whatever. Uh, if you promote it, we're going to get you involved in it. You can do, you get the exclusive on the local story, you know, those kinds of things. That stuff works really, really well. And that's how I would do it. Um, and the other thing that's really important is who you have involved in your event. Most of the successful events in America, uh, and there are lots of successful events, but the ones that are the biggest and most successful surround themselves with really, really smart local people who they get involved as volunteers at all kinds of different levels. And you want smart people who know lots of people who can invite lots of people, smart people who know how to encourage people to buy, uh, know how to run auctions, uh, because you can't just assume they're going to buy. You need to nudge them a little bit. You need to help them along. You need to have somebody standing there by the booths and saying, Hey, let me tell you about this painting. You know, there's a lot of different things you can do that will uh, really help this. And remember, the artist component is really, really important. Uh, there's a show, I won't mention names, but there was a show. It was really a big and prominent show. And they decided in their infinite wisdom that they were going to be a little bit more equal and sensitive to the needs of the local community. Makes sense, right? So they said, all right, we're going to make 50% of the artists local artists and 50% national artists. And... Uh, so they did not jury in the local artists. They just put in the squeaky wheels, the ones who, you know, always were asking. And as a result, they brought the overall quality of the show down because some of the artists that they lit in were not very good. I happened to be at that show. I happened to be judging that show. It was a, almost an embarrassment. And the thing that happens is the, the good artists who come in say, wait, wait a minute, I'm showing with other artists. They should all be good. It shouldn't be a bunch of good artists and a bunch of lesser developed artists. I mean, every one of us was a bad artist at one time. So I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that, but you've got to have good artwork. And so the key to that is to have an independent third party juror who juries in. It's fine to have local people. It's fine if you want to have 50% local people, but make sure they're juried in and, and that you're not doing favors for somebody who who, you know, you like them, but they're not a very good painter. And I know I'll get emails about this. I'm sorry. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. But the, the reality is if you're trying to build a reputation for a show, you need to have good painters. And, and um, so the good painters would not accept the invitations for the show when they were invited back. And the word got out that the show didn't sell well. 
And because people saw, I don't know, something about bad paintings brought things down, I suppose. And as a result, things changed uh, pretty dramatically. And so uh, what you want to do is focus on getting really, really good painters in there. Quality matters, local quality matters, national quality matters, but make sure that it's good because word spreads and artists don't want to come to shows where they're not going to make any money. Second question comes from Scott Pineau in Dalton, Pennsylvania. He said, I just read your book and I now have a clearer vision on how to handle social media and how advertising is a more effective tool. Each day I spend at least an hour working on some aspect of marketing planning. Bravo on that. And I'm working to launch my business in the fall of 24. I'm developing ways to make buying my art enjoyable as an experience for collectors. My question to you is since I'm planning on selling directly to collectors, when I'm approached regarding my works, is there an easy way to vet the potential buyer early on to make sure I'm dealing with a legitimate collector without insulting them or coming across like I don't know what I'm doing? We hear a lot about fraudulent sellers. Uh, we hear a lot about fraudulent buyers. But to what degree should I be concerned about potential fraudulent buyers? Well, that's a loaded question, isn't it? I mean, you know, we're all getting these emails that say, hey, it's my, uh, I saw your work online. It's my wife's anniversary. I want to buy her something special. I like your paintings. I want to buy one of your paintings. Turns out to be a big scam. You know, they send the painting, the check bounces, uh, you know, et cetera. Watch that. It's very, very tough. But, you know, I think that first off, um, why do you need to find out if they're legit buyers? You know, if, if you're doing something quality, uh, you can kind of tell if somebody's quality, but be careful about that. You know, I, I was at a gallery in New York one day. I was sitting there waiting for a meeting. And this guy walks out of the gallery and the gallery owner says, hey, that guy just spent a half a million dollars in paintings. He said, when he first came in, I looked him up and down. He was wearing flip-flops, shorts, and a t-shirt. I thought, he can't afford anything. He can't, he doesn't belong here. Well, he just sold his company. His kids are out of college. He had plenty of money and he spent a half a million dollars. So you can't judge people based on the way they look. Uh, you know, you want to, you might want to have legitimate payment methods. You might want to have a credit card machine so that you can, uh, you know, run it through the bank. If the, if there's fraud, that's the bank's problem, not yours. Uh, I wouldn't, you know, if you want to take checks, you can take checks, but there's certainly ways that you can call and check those checks or deposit those checks with your, with your camera and your phone instantly to make sure they go through. So there's a lot of things you can do. You're, you're going to have some risk, but I wouldn't worry about that too much. I think the thing that I worry about more is that if you try to categorize people, you might lose people because uh, some people might be offended by some attempt to find out if, they're, if they have the money. I, I wouldn't worry about that. I just don't worry about that kind of stuff at all. You know, the majority of people who are going to buy something are going to be legit. And, you know, once in a while you get burned. I got burned on something one time. Uh, pretty badly. It stung, but I didn't stop doing everything. I was just a little more cautious. The other thing is I'm a little concerned about what you said is I'm only going to sell direct. Now, a lot of artists do that, and that's a really, really wonderful thing. But here's why I oftentimes say to people, be careful of what you wish for. Because, uh, you know, the, art of the, the typical artist argument is, well, I, you know, I get to keep all the money. So I, you know, now I have the responsibility of selling all the paintings. I get to keep all the money. I have to do all the advertising. I have to attract all the customers. I have to deal with the customer service of all the customers. I got to answer questions. I got to be on the phone. I got to be constantly reaching out to people. I got to constantly advertising. Man, it's exhausting. And yet if someone good likes your work, like a gallerist, for instance, they are selling while you're sleeping. I mean, literally, in some cases, because if you get a gallery in a in a you know a different time zone and they're open while you're still in bed, you know, if they're in New York and you're in California, they're open and they're selling paintings while you're sleeping. And if you have a, a gallery in Alaska or you know a Hawaii, there are a lot of different things. You know, they're selling while you're sleeping and they're selling for you. If you have two or three galleries, I don't like to have more than two or three. I have three currently. Uh, I have a, uh, an offer from a fourth I'm considering, but you know, I don't know if I can, I, I can produce enough quality for that, but 
Um, some artists sell direct uh, up to a certain size and then anything over eight by 10 or whatever, they'll sell through galleries. That's an option. But, you know, you have a lot of work to do. And I like to leverage, you know, if I can have three people, three different people selling for me, you know, if my sales skill isn't very good, then, I, you know, if I'm, if I screw up, I don't eat. You know, if I've got three galleries and one of the three is good, at least I eat something. If two of the three are good, I might sell a little bit more. All three are selling stuff. I'm, I'm golden. Now, I don't ever like to turn 100% over of anything over to somebody else. I want to make sure you remain in control. I talk about that in my book a little bit. You probably saw that. But, um, you know, you could, you could try a, a couple of things. First off, you know, direct marketing, and that's what you're doing when you're selling direct it's a whole different game. You have to build email lists. You have to do a lot of different things differently and you got to stay in touch with people and there's a limit to how much ask you can make. Uh, so you got to look for different ways to get your work in front of different people, get it seen and get it seen by people that you don't know exist because the ultimate buyer is somebody you don't even know. So uh, I like the idea of multiplying yourself and I hope you consider it. Talking about selling direct, I think it's, it's okay. But um, you got to be really good at this. And I don't know, I'm pretty good at it, but I'm not, I'm not selling any of my work direct. So just, just a thought. Anyway, that's the Marketing Minute, and I hope it's been helpful. This has been the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes. You can learn more at artmarketing.com.